Hello in Yali Madat, everyone. My name is Lela Mulji, and I will be the moderator for today's Critical Conversation. The Critical Conversation series had been conceived as an ITRIB USA initiative aimed at engaging the entire Jamaat, but with a focus on 18 to 40 year olds. This series aims to explore the critical questions of our time within the context of our faith. Before we begin, I would like to read a land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land and enduring relationship that exists between the indig indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from the time immemorial. immemorial. It is important to understand that the long existing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or a historical context. Colonialism is an ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of the present participation. We would like to open our session today by acknowledging that the land on which I reside is occupied unceded seized territory of the Muncie Lenape tribes of the Northern New Jersey area. These tribes have stewarded this land throughout the generations and we would like to pay our respects to the elders both past and present. We believe that the work we do in sessions like these are a part of our ongoing responsibility to acknowledge the ongoing harm that is done to indigenous people on these lands and working towards a society that is more just, equitable, and in keeping with our ethics as Ismaili Muslims. Today, we are talking about exploring the role of art and culture in preservation and restoration. Today's session will provide an opportunity for us to explore the role of organizations and programs such as the Aga Khan Trust for Culture and the Aga Khan Music Initiative to support communities in preserving narratives and restoring the dignity and quality of life. During this session, we will also see a Q&A box through which you can share additional questions and thoughts during the session. We will try to address as many questions submitted through today's um, talk as we can. And with that, let me introduce you to our wonderful panelists. Fairoz Nishanova, welcome. Fairoz Nishanova is a cultural development specialist with a lifelong love of performing arts, music, and dance that embraces the many styles and traditions of the lands where she has lived, worked, and traveled. Born in Sri Lanka to Uzbek parents, she grew up in Amman, Jordan, and was educated at Moscow State University, where she received a BA with distinction in history and Asian and African studies, and at the London School of Economics and Political Science, from which she received a postgraduate degree with distinction in international relations and world politics. Ms. Nishanova began her career at the Federal Assembly of Ruth of the Russian Federation and continued at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. She joined the Aga Khan Development Network in 2000 and has served as director of the Aga Khan Music Initiative at the Geneva-based Trust for Culture since 2005. In this capacity, she has overseen the creation of the Aga Khan Music Awards structure and the organization of its inaugural ceremony, as well as the creation in October 2020 of the Aga Khan Music Program. Ms. Nishanova serves as the executive producer of the Aga Khan Music Program's concerts, recordings, films, public events. Ms. Nishanova is on the current international jury of the European Festivals Association. Khalil Pirani, welcome. Khalil Pirani AIA is a volunteer to bolster the outreach of the AKTC's education program and has made several presentations on the work of the AKTC. He is a practicing architect with over 25 years of experience in Boston, Massachusetts. He attended MIT for his master's in architecture and the University of Pennsylvania for his undergraduate studies. He is, a li he is licensed in the state of New York and Massachusetts and is a member of the American Institute of Architects. Khalil has been a visiting scholar at MIT and has moderated discussion panels, made presentations, and written several articles about architecture and cultural sensitivity. And he has co-edited a book, Understanding Islamic Architecture, with Professor Attila 
Attilo Petrocu Seculi, published by Taylor and Francis in 2000. At the onset, we would like to note that the views of our speakers expressed during the course of this discussion are their own. Now let's turn to our conversation. As we begin, um, could you tell the audience a little bit more about yourselves and how you engage in the world of arts and culture? And before this, we're actually delighted to let you know that Hazri Mom has made the decision to merge the music initiative with the Aga Khan Music Rewards and created uh, a program known as the Aga Khan Music Program. So before we do this, I'd like to show us a little bit, a little video. Hello and welcome. Today, I'm delighted to share with you the news that His Highness the Aga Khan approved the creation of the Aga Khan Music Program, which, effective immediately, will take over all existing activities of the Aga Khan Music Initiative and the Aga Khan Music Awards. While our name changes and our activities are strengthened and solidified, our nature remains the same. The five main areas of the Aga Khan Music Program's work are the awards, music education and mentoring, creation and performance, production, documentation and dissemination, and online projects and archives. We express our endless gratitude to His Highness the Aga Khan and Prince Amin Aga Khan for the clarity and generosity of their vision and leadership. Listening to music, practicing music, sharing music can bring a strong cultural anchor deepening a sense of community, identity, and heritage, while simultaneously reaching out in powerful ways to people of different backgrounds. So if I could ask Fairuz to get us started, please. Thank you very much. Good evening, no, good afternoon uh, to everyone So joining from a different part of the world. Um, and thank you for sharing this video, Laila, because it saves me the, the job of having to make this wonderful announcement that we now have the Aga Khan Music Program that has taken over all of the existing responsibilities and activities of the program formerly known as the Music Initiative that went through many iterations of its own name as well. And also we're so delighted to welcome into the into this realm, the Aga Khan Music Awards, which opens a whole new uh, horizon of possibilities and opportunities to the program that we are so devoted to. Um, and to answer your question as to how I made my way into, into arts and culture, well, you just saw the person um, bearing responsibility for that. It, it, it's His Highness. He um, originally hired me for a completely different job. I, I came into the AKDN to look after education and social development. And um, along the way, um, it, it, I, I had the privilege of coming into AKDN on the cusp of our entering um, into the region of Central Asia, which was a completely new region for the network and which at that particular time was dealing with very specific sets of challenges. And those challenges stretched into every area of the newly independent states um, creation and also their functioning as the independent countries. So um, as we made the commitment um, to, to the whole region, of post-Soviet Central Asia and later to post-Taliban Afghanistan, we had no shortage of activities in both social and economic development that needed and required our immediate attention. But in the sphere of culture, we discovered this catastrophic um, situation that the local and classical musical arts and music and arts education in those countries was going through. So this, it's at that, very critical moment that the music initiative, as it was then known, was created. Um, and I joined the team that was um, helping it be born and helping it understand what were its main priorities from the very beginning. And the rest is history. I never looked back. It's never been a job. It's, it's, um, it's a passion. It's, um, it's a commitment. It's my obsession. It's something that I'm immensely proud of. And also, um, enormously grateful to, to His Highness and to AKDN for bestowing this privilege upon me. 
Thank you so much. Khalil? Thank you, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Farara, and to Itrab USA for inviting me to this session. I'm really privileged to be here. Uh, well, my journey as an architect started uh, back in my high school days when I decided to go into the program. But at that time, I really didn't know how much fun it would be to be an architect like as it's today, right? With what we are going through and the challenges that the societies are facing and how art and architecture has such a big influence on the lives of people. I didn't know that back then, but I'm so glad I picked that profession. I still have no complaints about it. My real eyes opened up uh, when I joined the architecture program at MIT in my graduate program with the Aga Khan program. And that's where I think we started to learn about the challenges that the Muslim societies are facing in the built environment, their identities, you know, the issues with uh, fighting with the internationalism, the modernism, and trying to copy things from the West without you know, looking at your local context. So all those challenges sort of surfaced on me and we didn't have answers back then, but now I think it's becoming more and more clear as you will see the programs of the award, the Aakhan Award for Architecture, the Trust for Culture, the Historic Cities program. I think these programs are helping uh, sort of clear the you know, I think the vision of different people. But thank you so much and uh, looking forward to the session here, thank you. Well, thank you again to both of you. And uh, let's get started with our first question. So both of you come from different worlds in the space of arts and cultures, but have clearly invested your lives and your careers into producing and educating on arts and culture. Why should we consider arts and culture important to both your physical and spiritual lives? Shall I go first, Lena? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, so I think, I think some of us, uh, many of us look, look at arts, you know, not so seriously as we normally should. Like we live in world of arts, right? We, the food we eat is part of our arts and culture, the languages, the dress we have, the music, of course, we will talk about more. Uh, the buildings that we see around us, the fine arts, right? It's all part of our culture, but the way uh, and the question we have to ask is, why is the Imamat institution, why is Hazar Imam putting so much investment into this whole Aga Khan Trust for Culture umbrella, right? I think it's just not, just not just so we can have a good time. It's more about a journey that we have on this earth, uh, our lives on earth. You know, let's say we live on this earth for 60, 70, 80 years. It is to make this journey of our, of our presence on this earth a little bit of a better journey for the lives to come yet. I think the arts and culture help us make us feel better. It helps us make feel, makes us feel good on earth. It helps smiles on our face, right? Smiles is very important as we have heard in many, many firmans. And what would bring smiles? It's arts and culture is one of the things that can do that, right? And I think this is my personal interpretation. This is why Hazri Imam has been putting so much emphasis, so much investment into arts and culture. And of course, we'll see uh, in this later part of the session, it's to improve the built environment around us as well. But primarily, it's about having a nice, good life, a physical life on earth, so that we prepare ourselves properly for the journey to come uh, you know, after our uh, passing from this journey. I think in this context, uh, Leila, shall we uh, look at a slide um, in which I think Hazrimam made a reference to this context of Dean and Dunya uh, during his interview to Robert Ivey, uh, which took place in 2001 at Aglimon. I think he says that in Islam, uh, it's a very special, shall I read that maybe, uh, the value system of Islam in terms of interrelationship between what we call deen and dunya or faith and world is very particular in Islam, right? It is very particular in Islam. And in a sense, they relate to each other on an ongoing way, right? There is a continuation of the Islamic value system into the physical environment, which is interesting and special to Islam. And I think this is what is reflected in much of the great Islamic architecture. So I think we sort of didn't know much that 
deen and dunya could be sort of you know relating us to on a daily basis uh, as we live through this world so i think it like you know we know these are interlinked uh, with the spirituality of our lives while we are physically present here so i think that's why arts and culture music uh, the food the language the fine arts the art form that we live around here right currently everybody is sitting around somewhere in their houses uh, maybe in a library or a school or wherever you are you are surrounded by a built environment right your rooms the houses this is and they sort of change our moods they sort of impact us how we live and it's important to make them nicer and nicer our gardens our yards they all have an impact uh, on us and i think that's why uh, the trust our country trust is putting so much emphasis uh, into this whole program of arts and culture i think i'm going to stop here lala and maybe you'll let feroz add some thoughts absolutely thank you well done, Khalil. You can just go on. Then I can. Uh, then, I, then I can just nod. And uh, no, <laughs> no I, I agree with you completely and fully. I think what to me was um, uh, a discovery is that this this question you sort of answer it on on, on two levels uh, when we face it as as individuals. And uh, level one is arts and culture. On a very basic level, this is what separates us from all the other species. We are such social creatures. We, we've all learned over the last 15 months how difficult it is not to, not to share, not to gather together, not to gather together around the table. And what we do, and we are the only species that really do that, is we tell each other stories. We are the, uh, the, the, um, this weird clan of storytellers. And uh, for those of us who are, look, all of us are Easterners, right? If we divide the world into Great West and Great East, we are from the East, but we find ourselves in the Western world. So in the East, um, those uh, uh, story, stories have always become music. When you, when the storytelling process has very harmoniously merged with the composition process over centuries. So as Easterners, I think we carry inside ourselves this um, extraordinary ability to relate to the form of art that is both ancient and contemporary. The role of organizations such as AKGN is to recognize that forms of the art, if they remain only ancient, they become museum objects that no one else loves, no one else uses, no one else tears apart and makes their own, and that's when the art form pretty much dies. And what we faced as a development network when we uh, made this commitment to, to, to Central Asia and to Afghanistan was exactly that. We saw the art forms either on the verge of being extinct or modified and tampered with to the extent where they became unrecognizable, but also unusable by the new generation because they simply no longer considered them their own. They had no relevance uh, to the everyday life um, of both artists, but also audiences. And, um, you know, there is this, uh, for those of us who find ourselves in the West, there's this um, weird concept that I, I could never fully subscribe to of art as entertainment. That's something that you buy a ticket to and then for 1.5 or two hours a day, because you paid for the ticket, you go and you be entertained. But in the East, historically, and to this day, Music is not something that is entertainment. Music is something that is present every single day in everybody's life. In so many communities in Asia, if the artist or musician is not present at the most important ceremonies of people's lives, uh, be it birth, be it wedding, be it funeral, um, if the artists are not present, very often the community is lost because the tradition, the format of the event is known only by the artists. So they are not only the storytellers, they are also the carriers of the traditions. They are the ones who make it relevant to the next generation. And so when that is taken away, which is the situation that we encountered, well, you have generations that no longer speak. So grandparents do not necessarily understand the, 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 the grandchildren. And when we ask ourselves why, what separates art and music in the East um, from their counterparts in the West? What made the art and music in the East so dangerous that the um, newly installed regime, be it the Soviet regime, be it the Taliban, be it the others, what 
Sep what, what is so important in the um, regional arts and culture? The answer is simple. It's, it's basis, it's foundation in the um, religious and devotional practice of that nation, of, of that region. The music is something that is very hard to separate from the expression of faith and from prayers themselves. So when you have a new regime that is trying to change the history of the region and is trying to create a new kind of citizen that doesn't necessarily subscribe to the beliefs, that doesn't have the same roots in the lands of, of, of their ancestors, it somehow became the easiest to do away with the musical traditions, with the artistic traditions, um, so that de-rooted community could be easily conveyed uh, or, or um, could be easily transformed into something else. So our job was not only to restore the time-honored tradition of the, of the master apprentice, Ustad Shagird, but also make it relevant to the kids, the students of today. Um, and so that's the journey that we've been on since um, the, the late 90s. And it's as fascinating as it was all those years ago. And those stories, when you're talking about two different mediums, still talk to the stories, right? Still talk to the stories and the traditions, which is really beautiful. And I think you've spoken about this a little bit, but let's explore this a little further. When the Agacan Development Network enters into a country to provide developmental support, the organization focuses on three structures of development. It focuses on economic, social, and cultural. The cultural arm is represented by the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, or AKTC, which from their website states that it focuses on the physical, social, cultural, and economic revitalization of communities in the developing world. So you touched on this a little bit before, but could you share a little bit more about the work you do with this organization and the AKTC's goals and initiatives? So Faroz, can we start with you? Um, maybe continue a little bit about what you were saying and then um, we can go Absolutely. to- Absolutely. Um, so AKDN as a development network, it stands on those three pillars, right? Economic, social, and cultural development. And uh, as you all know, uh, a lot of institutions in the economic development part are for profit. And when I say profit, I mean very long-term investment, 50 years, 60 years. Uh, it, it takes a very, when the, when the investment is done uh, responsibly, it takes a very long time for the original client to become the master of the process. His Highness always says that this is your benchmark. We leave when our original beneficiaries have become the masters of the process. That's when we can go. But it takes a very long time for that to happen. So the economic development part is usually the one that all of our clients, governments or countries, this is the one that they welcome the most because this brings in um, culture, this brings in tourism and uh, 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 enterprise support and banking and microfinance. And it's, it's exciting. There's energy projects and electricity and communications. What's not to be excited about, right? Then the social development part is usually tolerated because there's universities and schools and clinics and um, support for the NGOs and um, uh, especially female NGOs that are supported. So that's tolerated. The one that's at best overlooked or at worst not uh, wanted is the cultural development part because it's the, traditionally, and it's a wrong tradition to follow. This is the one that needs to be corrected. Um, there is this perception, completely wrong perception, that culture is a permanent burden on somebody else's budget. And what Aga Khan Trust for Culture has been proving since the 70s, since 1970s, that when it's properly looked after and when it's properly invested into, not only does culture stop being the burden on somebody else's budget, it becomes a trampoline from, all, from which all the other economic and social development initiatives can grow. It takes a very long time for that to be proven right. And so we at the AKDN are extraordinarily privileged to have um, the, the founders that believe in this, that are cognizant of the fact that sometimes it will take 10, sometimes 15 years for something, for the notion that we brought in to be proven uh, uh, right. And it's not only the commitment, but also the flexibility of our leadership that is uh, uh, invaluable. Because um, His Highness said once that just like pluralism, our work is a process and not a product. Uh, 
And we need to recognize that the process changes every day, values change, uh, the, the relevance changes. And we need to imagine that our communities, our beneficiaries, they, 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 they're riding the tides of history. We need to do it with them. We need to accompany them in this process. And that takes, that is where not only the length, but also the flexibility of our commitment comes from. And it's, um, it's invaluable. And to me, this is what makes AKDN a standout development network among all the other development institutions out there. No, I think that's that's a very good point, and uh, I think Feroz, you're totally right. Culture is always a burden. I mean, I mean, let's look at some of the historic cities program, right? Let's say, for example, the Homayun's tomb that was just recently restored and opened. It's a huge building, and it's quite expensive to maintain a large building like that. I mean, we probably know from our own houses, right? We have to keep up the roof, the walls, the paint, you know. So such buildings are a big burden for any institution. So I think you're totally right, but I think the way the trust for culture approaches it, that it uses that to become trampoline, like you said, Virus, and create generation of income, wealth, and, and all of that. And then with partners, uh, they sort of bring in partners from other agencies and help improve the quality of life of people that are surrounding that area. Um, so I think, uh, Leila, if you want to watch the video now, or maybe a little second later, you could sort of share a glimpse of how this project, as one of the many other programs of the trust of the Historic Cities program, how it managed to not only restore the Humayun's tomb, but it sort of educated the people, the children around it about how they should be feeling good about, what they should be proud about it, and created jobs and incomes for the surrounding neighborhood and Basti in the area. Shall we, do, shall we view that now? Uh, okay, let's take a look. Okay. Investment in cultural legacies can be a powerful agent in improving the quality of human life. We look at the title, Reviving History, Rebuilding Lives. The completion of the restoration work on Humayun's tomb marks a major step in the transformation of a once run-down area. His Highness the Aga Khan joined the Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, in the heart of New Delhi to mark the occasion at the newly restored tomb. The project, an urban renewal initiative by the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, is run in conjunction with a number of partners, including the Archaeological Survey of India, the Saratan Tata Trust and the city of New Delhi. The Humayun Tomb Project was the first public-private partnership for cultural heritage in Indian history. The word partnership, in fact, could be the watchword of this celebration. What we honor today, above all else, is the spirit of partnership in which this work has unfolded. India has one of the richest repositories of heritage anywhere in the world, and it is critical that we find practical and innovative ways to preserve and maintain this heritage. Humayun's tomb is just one of many sites of cultural importance in the Nizamuddin conservation area. Named after the early 14th century saint Hazrat Nizamuddin Aulia, who was buried here, seven centuries of tomb building have made this one of the densest groupings of medieval Islamic buildings in the world. Conservation works have revived a craft-based approach. Local craftsmen have been trained to match the work of their forefathers using traditional tools, building traditions and materials. For example, one million kilos of cement laid here in the 20th century has been removed from the roof by craftsmen using hand tools. Ornamental star-shaped ceiling patterns in lime plaster have been painstakingly restored by specially trained craftsmen. These combined sites 
will create a heritage zone of unmatched scale, value, and visibility, a proud symbol of Indian history. But cultural history is only one part of the story. A central premise of our work is that cultural enrichment and historic restoration can also be effective springboards for economic and for social progress. The project aims not just to restore sites of cultural importance, it's determined to bring about a complete transformation of the area. A programme of social projects has sought to improve the lives of local residents in the nearby densely populated Nizamuddin Basti. Following major renovations of the school building, the municipal primary school today provides quality education to more than 600 children. Improved teaching and innovations such as computer courses and street computer kiosks have helped to raise standards of learning. Vocational training opportunities have been opened up. For example, more than 400 women have been trained in crafts such as RE embroidery and tailoring. Many are now preparing a variety of products and generating an income for their families. And the municipal polyclinic has improved access to health care. For example, a recently established community health program employs health workers trained from the Basti to identify vulnerable individuals and ensure they can access health facilities. We start working with women when they're pregnant to ensure a safe delivery. We work with the little children to make sure that they get pre-primary education. Then we work with children who get primary education. We have an English program for adolescents. We have skill training for youth. We work with the women to ensure that they have access to some form of livelihood. If they can uh, go out of the house, great. If they can't, then we have craft activities for them. In addition, we, we work with the community to form groups so that they take over the management of uh, the facilities that we are creating. We have been encouraged by the impact of this project on the lives of some 20,000 inhabitants in the Nizamuddin Basti area. But we cannot assume that such favorable outcomes will emerge automatically from such work. They must be carefully considered and continually monitored. A measuring process that begins when a project is launched and continues long beyond its completion. Looking to the future, work at the Sunda Nursery aims to create an urban oasis for New Delhi. Established in the 20th century to grow plants for the city, work is underway to transform the nursery into a major landscape space that combines leisure facilities, historical sites and environmental conservation. Since 2008, over 20,000 plants have been added to the nursery, ensuring a vibrant and diverse green space for future generations to enjoy. I would conclude as I began with a heartfelt salute to the partners who have worked with us in making this day possible, and to all those who have cared so deeply about this project and supported it so thoughtfully. You've helped to make the Humayun tomb endeavor into a great gift to the people of this neighborhood, to the city of Delhi, to the people of India, and indeed, the peoples of the world. And you have validated the foundations on which many similar initiatives here in India and elsewhere can be built. Thank you. I think we can stop here. Yeah. Thank you. So I think this sort of sets the, you know, sort of answers a lot of the questions how trust for culture is using built environment or a project or a building, you know, reviving the building, making it back to, you know, how it used to be for the future generations and also help improve the quality of life of the surrounding communities. Um, so back to you, Lela. Yep. And we're lucky if it's a building, sometimes it's a trash site. 
Uh, right. For example, the Cairo Park, which is one of the most remarkable yeah. projects that we've ever begun. You know, it began with, a, with an extraordinary story when His Highness wanted to make a, a gift to the city of Cairo, to the city right. that his ancestors, the Fatimids, have established. And that gift was, in his mind, not another school, not another clinic, but to one of the most polluted cities in the world. He wanted to give a green lung uh, where, where people could, 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 could breathe, literally breathe. Um, and the only way to do so in the heart of historic Cairo was to take on a trash site uh, that was um, 30 um, hectares. I don't know what it is in acres. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. a very large site. And then uh, the first, I think, few years of the project were not the building of the park, but the cleaning up of the site. And in that process, the ancient Ayyubid wall of Cairo was discovered underneath the, underneath the rubble. So the project became twofold, the building of the park, the creation of the park, and the restoration of the wall. And then the 600,000 member community that surrounds the park, which is one of the poorest communities in the heart of, of historic Cairo, were brought into the project as well. So it's um, it's it's once we tried summarizing the lessons that uh, um, His Highness gives as the uh, lessons for success of a cultural development project, and one of them is recognize from the very beginning that we cannot do it alone that unless we involve the local community from the very start, unless we engage into partnerships from the very start, it's not going to fly. You cannot come into the community 10 years after the beginning of the project and tell them that this is something that was done for them. Um, it's something that the community has to own because only then can a patron actually depart at some point and go and help other communities that are just as worthy of and, and, need, and needing um, the help, but um, yeah. It's good if it's building. Yeah, I think these pro these projects are more like ripple effects. You know, the good examples in different parts of the world, right, Faros? To yeah. show to the other agencies, other institutions, other countries, and national uh, leaderships that you could do these projects and also improve the quality of life of people. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the one of the uh, buildings, uh, the flagship buildings that was restored in Cairo now became a music school. And it was sort of, uh, for an outside investor, it was sort of a frivolous thought, why would you put a music school in the middle of one of the poorest areas? Well, because not only does it give um, psychological relief to the kids that sometimes are too traumatized to tell their stories, but if you if you ask them to dance that story or play that story or draw that story, well, that comes out and hopefully um, helps heal some very long term damage that otherwise would have been kept inside. But also because we are again thanks to partnerships because we're able to give those kids professional diplomas at the end of four years of study. Four years later, they enter the professional world. They serve. The, um, the local ceremonies, the gatherings as drummers, as trumpeters, as, as, as storytellers, again, and they bring income to their families that um, the families did not imagine before. And one of the most peculiar things that I've discovered in this work is that when the arts community loses respect at home, it's the recognition from abroad that very often return, helps return that, that, that respect. So when a musician that was educated in one of our schools and centers that we've established throughout Central Asia and also in Egypt, uh, in Aswan and Cairo, and also now in Pakistan and um, uh, partially in West Africa and Mali, when the those musicians come back home after a European or a North American tour with an annual income enough to feed the family. That's usually when the doors of our schools get a lot of knocks from parents because they suddenly consider this tradition worthy of an investment of four years of their child's life uh, because this is something that brings in not only respect but the semblance of financial stability and viability. And it's, it cannot be overlooked. Um, you know, doing culture just for the sake of culture cannot be done, but it's all of those little um, uh, building blocks that support the profession, that support the image of an artist, that support the image of the community, that finally allow AKGN to not only celebrate what has been achieved, but also release those toolkits to the other communities and other parts of the world that require the same kind of intervention. You know what, I think you are actually talking to what we were about to discuss next, and I guess maybe we could elaborate a little bit, but 
it's so interesting that you brought up this point because we don't often see multilateral development organizations creating an emphasis on arts and culture um, the way that the AKDN does, right? And we, you've talked a little bit about the benefits of this, but why is the AKTC so heavily invested in arts and cultures and how does this improve and impact the quality of life? If you could speak a little bit more, you mentioned the Cairo project. Are there any other examples that either one of you have um, about about this, and um, you know, we kind of, we kind of, uh, I think more people know about the project, the Hamayans tune, and, and and the one and the project in Cairo. Are there any others that sort of stand out to you? I think All of them. Are quite, yeah, there are quite a few. Faraz, you probably know about the one in northern Pakistan, the Baltic Absolutely. Uh, I mean, over there, Lela, what used to happen was uh, the local communities about almost 30, 40 years ago, they thought that their indigenous architecture with stone and mud and wood was not good and they would look towards the West for ideas they would try to build with concrete and you know glass and stuff, which was not local material, right? So there was a sense of inferiority complex, I would say, back in those communities. And I think then that's when the trust went in there, they restored the Baltic fort, right, Boris? And that really told you know the story to them that look, this is what you have is precious. And now the fort is a museum. <laughs> So people from all over the world now go to those villages to see the fort, the people realize, the locals realize, wow, this is something we need to value, right? And we need to preserve. And that's what they are now, you know, sort of sharing that with their younger folks and younger generations. I don't know if there was anything else you want to add. Yeah, oh, you know, I'm. I can. I can quite a few, speak yeah. about. I can speak about all of them. There, there. I mean, what what's been really important uh, to me for me to see is that every area of intervention would bring in a cluster of AKDN agencies. Uh, so we would begin restoring a park. We now have a whole uh, collection of, of parks, right? We have the one in Bamako, the one in Cairo, the one in New Delhi. Um, we are, uh, are now heavily engaged in the Shalimar Gardens. Lahore and also restoring the Wazirhan Mosque. We have the Babur Gardens in uh, Kabul um, and we also have the uh, Korok Park in Tajikistan in Gorno Barakshan. And every single one of them, even though you cannot compare them in sizes, you know, Korok Park is probably one portion of the Cairo Park. But what is true for every single one of them is that they have changed the living standards for the community that benefit from them. They have completely changed the way the community sees itself, the way it sees um, their, their, their lives. I'll tell you one funny story about the Cairo Park and how that one changed everybody's, because the community that um, surrounds the park, it's a very conservative Muslim community. So um, in 99% of the cases, the bride and groom met at the wedding because there was no appropriate setting for them to ever see each other before the wedding, something that would be considered appropriate and respectable by the elderly. Now that has changed completely in the last 15 years because everyone now meets at the Cairo Park, at the Al-Azhar Park. Um, it's extraordinary that the, the, the um, uh, area of Cairo that was known for Al-Azhar University is known now as Al-Azhar Park area because it's, it's unbelievable what um, joy it brings to the community because um, we have had so many things with that park and with all the other projects we've proven so many times that the impossible happens every day because pretty much everything that happens in all of these projects including the one I have the honor of running the music program it's at least one person at some point said that this was impossible to do. So when you do the impossible and when the impossible is something that flourishes, I think that's also when those partners that we cannot do our job without, that's when they come in. And we've made it a rule at the AKTC that not one single project will be done only on the imamate funding. Unless we secure funding from the outside partners, unless someone else believes in it as much as we do, we do not go into the project. And when those projects become independent, that frees up more of the amount of funding so that we can finally go into the areas that require our intervention and our presence just as much. But until now, we're not able to obtain that. We can show the little... Um, clip uh, uh, Lila now because it talks about why we could finally allow ourselves to create the music awards because one thing that we do with our projects is um, they 
their continued success requires very long-term commitment, very, very long-term commitment. And when that long-term commitment bears um, a fruit of financial independence for that, for that particular institution that we have helped create, that's when we can leave. And in the music program, we were for at least 10 years aware of incredible artistic talent in the parts of the Muslim world that was not yet covered by AKDN Action. So by creating the Aga Khan Music Awards, His Highness is allowing us to celebrate that talent that is just as worthy of recognition and our support, but was maybe overlooked slightly simply because we were not present in that particular country. So the story of us creating the Music Awards and also celebrating the first inaugural edition, we just need to look at, at four minutes of that film and then I, I will encourage the audience to jump onto the um, uh, AKDN YouTube channel or music programs, Vimeo and YouTube channels, and then maybe watch the film in its entirety. Okay, here we go. MashaAllah. Second one is... Welcome to this, the first edition of the Aga Khan Music Awards. Now I know that in some parts of the world, the words Muslim and music are not often linked together in the public mind, but they should be. The cultural heritage of Islam has long embraced musical language as an elemental expression of human spirituality identity and heritage while simultaneously reaching out in powerful ways to people of different backgrounds. Here's the thing. It's not one day award show. It's not a three hour award show. It's pretty much a festival. There is no Sufi aphorism. If you want to go north, go south. And that more or less describes the circuitous path that has now led finally to the implementation of the Music Awards. It was back in 2001 that my brother launched in Central Asia the Icon Music Initiative, as it was then called, with the aim of helping to preserve and revitalize traditional folk, classical, and devotional music in the region. The Aga Khan Music Initiative has been a pioneer in the emerging field of cultural development. It was given a mission to revitalize musical traditions that had been in many ways devastated by the experience of, of the Soviet Union. So we went and dealt with what was needed the most, and that was the revival of traditional and time-honored method of music education, the master apprentice or the Ustad Chagir. And then, because we live in the 21st century, we had to not only revive it, but also make it relevant to the kids, the students of today. It's a three or four day event that offers a panoramic view of the artistic excellence throughout the world of the Great East. And I'm so happy that through the vision of His Highness and Prince Amin, it was the city of Lisbon that was chosen to celebrate the first awards. Because historically it made perfect sense. It's literally at the crossroads of the great Western and Eastern civilization. In the Gulbenkian Orchestra, we had the most extraordinary partner. In the end, we opened the awards with a celebration of Eastern contemporary music performed by a Western orchestra. Part of the award's mission is to ensure that this now enters this global space and finds a way to become part of our global heritage. This music so easily exoticized, right? Like it's, we become the exotic. Uh, musicians so easily and uh, as I sitting through the um, 
the performance with the orchestra and the and master musicians of the Arafan, I, I felt so happy because somehow it, everything became more relevant and it, this music was the center and everything was being adapted to it. There you go, my latest baby. <laughs> it's stunning. And you know what? This is really amazing that we're actually sitting at home watching this and engaging across different spaces and different places. So let's shift a little bit to being at home for almost a year has shifted the way in which we engage with arts and culture. You know, how has the current pandemic ex influenced our experience of the arts? So maybe I could Khalil, ask Khalil, you. Khalil, you, oh. you, want, you want me to go first? Uh, I will rant a little bit about it, you know, because we, we keep saying that, oh, it's so good because we can reach all of these incredible audiences all over the world. But what else do we have to do, right? There has to be some advantage to, to everything that's going on. Um, sorry, my, my, my earbud is, is falling off. Um, I, I have a conflicted view about this because... Um, Music has to be experienced live. It was created centuries ago by our ancestors, by the, 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 the wonderful patrons of the musical art. It was created to be performed live and it always trickled down from the, um, the, 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 the palace or the house or the courtyard of the patron into the communities and who took it away and made it their own. Um, and Yes, it's been wonderful to, um, to, to share the music with very wide audiences. And yes, it's been an extraordinary opportunity to work with education institutions all over the world over the last 15 months, because suddenly so many of the toolkits that we made became relevant, became um, uh, in a format, in a video format, an audio format that was easily shared. It was a classroom, for example, if, they, if the uh, lesson was taking place on Zoom. But none of this will ever replace live music experience. So we, I was refusing for a long time to go into the digital tours because they were only queued for the first two weeks of the pandemic. After that, they just became an over um, uh, overload uh, offer of sort of you know bad Zoom quality recording. Um, but we did do our first digital tour of the of North America back in November. Those who are interested, we we have the whole tour recorded um, on Vimeo and and YouTube. And it was a it was a very interesting experience because we had uh, our flagship ensemble, the the Aga Khan Master Musicians or the Aga Khan Masters, who come from all of the uh, countries along the ancient Silk Route, and uh, they are extraordinary in the sense that they create. Um, for themselves and by themselves, they create music that is contemporary, that is tradition based, tradition inspired, but not tradition limited. And it makes this very unique body of music that we really wanted to share with the outside world and couldn't wait for, 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 for it to go back on stage live. So producing a digital tour was an interesting experience. We had artists in, on three continents. Um, we had incredible crews that were working with them round the clock because we had people in Central Asia, in Switzerland and in California. So the time zones were completely through the roof. Um, the editing was happening overnight, the dubbing was happening happening overnight. And uh, we did in the end um, have a wonderful product that will allow us to go to the most far away academies of the Aga Khan academies, for example, or the schools, and we will be able to deliver to them the performance of the Aga Khan masters as if they were playing and teaching them live. But um, I speak for every single artist that we have on our roster. Um, none of us can wait until we're back with the live audience because the kind of exchange, you know, again, coming back to this um, music as entertainment concept that is so popular in the West. Um, in the East, music is not just 
um, a sound. It's a healing process. It's uh, that's so, that's why so often Asian musicians. Um, despise the Western process of creating program notes before the concert, because they always say, well, I'm just a vessel of the divine. I go on stage, I will look at the audience, I will hear the energy of the place, I will understand who needs what, and then I will perform, but I can't decide this six months in advance when you're preparing your program notes and they're going into print. Um, so the live experience has so much more than just sound or dance or visuals. There is healing, there is connection, there is the exchange of adrenaline, there's the, 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 the feeding that goes from artist to the audience and back from the audience to the artist. And I, I for one, cannot wait for that experience to be back. Thank you. Khalil? No, I agree with uh, Feroz that live is the best, but, but so for Feroz, so somebody like me sitting in one, one corner of Boston cannot travel to, let's say, Tajikistan or somewhere. So, you know, it's, it's sort of second best, right? Like, so, you know, for this, with these uh, online uh, sort of... No, I think media. I just like having a choice. I have like yes, a choice. Yeah. I feel yeah. that for the last 15 <laughs> months, the choice has been removed. Yeah. And it's, it was good. We created incredible quality products that we uh, would not have created otherwise, yeah. but still. But I wanted to comment on the one uh, quick clip on the video was where people are sitting around the dinner table or having a meal and then somebody's playing music at the same time. And like you said, this is, has to be part of life. And I think it goes back to this whole conversation we had earlier that arts and culture is all interlinked with our physical life to help with the you know, life to move on to another world. It's all interlinked together. You know, we cannot separate, like you said, in the West, you, know, you can prepare a few months ahead of this whole concert, but it has to be part and parcel uh, that we live through it. Uh, so, yeah. Hey, um, so before we head into questions from the audience, we have one last question for you. Uh, would you have recommendations for the audience about engaging in further exploration of arts and cultures, like your one favorite, if we couldn't do anything else? <laughs> I Don't hesitate. To, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's up to the individual, right? I mean, could go into Don't music. hesitate, go, go yeah, for Don't it. hesitate, just go try it. Yeah, yeah. And, Best uh, things that I've done in my professional career, I did them absolutely petrified. Um, it's fine. It, you will always be, uh, you will always be uh, concerned about the outcome. You will never be able to predict the future. Just go for it. Um, it's, it's. Uh, I, I really don't like cliches, um, but uh, one of the cliches seems to be correct. And that point is that we do regret things that we have not done. So go for it. Give it a try. If a you try. fail, yeah. um, you'll have a terrific story to share with your grandkids. Yeah, and it's not the end of the life, right? It's no. only a, you know, it's a try. But I would say definitely, I agree with you. Try it out. Explore yourself. Believe in yourself. Feel good about it. And be confident and just try out any arts that you like. I think there is a lot of future in it. And there is a lot of fun in it, too. There's a lot of fun. Um, and it has a lot of benefits to the other communities outside uh, our own life. So it's benefiting others. And that's what makes you feel good about it when you're sharing your talent, your skills with other communities outside yourself. So, yeah. We want to say thank you so much for these reflective thoughts. We've, we've heard today about, about stories, the way stories are conveyed, either through built up areas, built up environments around, or through music, and how the importance is to continue them to engage with the divine, but also engage with community and culture, and what impacts this has. And the impacts are multi-layered and multifold. And I think that's something that many people don't really think about. I mean, we may think about it because the AKTC has kind of conditioned us to think about those things, that the impacts are multifold, but to educate those around us and the places that they, are go, they, they go into is just, amazing. So I thank you for that. And with everything that's been spoken about what we received, some questions from the audience, and um, I'm sure they would love to hear your insights on some of these. So I'm going to um, try to get through as many of these as possible, but let's see what we can do. Um, so can you give examples of converting culture, cultural development from a burden to trampoline to further development? So you talked about, you made that, um, that reference to make, using it as a trampoline rather than stopping it. So if, some, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. 
Humayun's you tomb. Go first? Yeah, I can try. Humayun's tomb was one example, right? Like we saw the example of it, where the old music, uh, old tomb of Humayun was more of a burden because it was falling apart. It was neglected for 200 years of colonial period in India. So it was a big burden for the government and they don't know what to do. So the trust, like you said, came in along with other partners. They're, they sort of restored it and made it a nice trampoline on which there was income generation from the visitors, right? They, a lot of more people used to go and visit. So from that income, along with other agencies, they started improving the quality of life of the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, is that the question, Lala? It's about how we are using those historic structures or other cultural development uh, buildings and how to sort of make it into a better future for, for the for some communities. Feroz, you must have more examples, I guess. I, I, I can I can I can pretty much pick any park, but I'll go back to Cairo because I spoke I've spoken about it. So in the beginning, real burden, right? A, a huge trash site. Right. Um, then you build this extraordinary thing uh, that you see from any plane that lands over Cairo. One of the first things you see is this is this park. Um, the lives of the communities changed. The perception of the communities changed. One of the remember I said that everyone told us many of the things that were impossible to do. One of the things that we were told was impossible is getting a local dweller to pay an entrance fee to enter a green space. And it was very important for the trust to have a symbolic, small, almost really, really symbolic entrance fee, but that every visitor to the park would pay. Not only was that impossible, I think on the holidays, on public holidays, we were hitting 45,000 visitors a day. So the park very quickly started making a surplus. The surplus was fully and is still continuously fully re-injected into the social development activities of the area. So local schools, local clinics, local handcrafts. The handcrafts that are made through the social development initiatives are then sold within the tourist shops inside the park. And it's, an, it's a cycle that thankfully is never ending. So now we have the music school and it's feeding into the arts scene in the um, city and then uh, that feeds into the performances within the park and outside the park and then we will have new generation of graduates who will hopefully model the clothes that were created by the females enterprise which was created with the money from the social development network so as long as you have this um, um, an understanding that whatever we create matters not just for its immediate effect, but for its long-term benefits. That, that I think that's the, the, the good example of this really no longer being a burden, but the trampoline mul multiplying itself. And I think we have a slide of this. I was just wondering if maybe we could pull it up and just share uh, the before and after piece of this. Uh, I think the right one shows the, like like Faru said, the, it used to be just a trash place, but for 500 years, this piece of land of 32 hectares was just sitting, doing nothing. And in a heavy winds, it would just blow a lot of dust into the uh, Darbul Ahmar communities. So I think that's where I think the trust came in and they picked on this uh, with the permission of the government. Uh, turned it into a park and you could see, I mean, you could see how Cairo is very little park, a lot of built environment, uh, houses. This park is now like a lung uh, for the city. Yeah. But also the, the trash that you see on your right, the trash side, this is after several years of cleanup. Uh, yes. This is not how we discovered yeah. it. And the park uh, picture that you have on the left, I think this was taken very soon after the opening. Now, now it looks very different. It's grown. Grow Those trees, palms yeah. that were grown, the palm trees. And uh, so every, everyone who is watching, I really encourage you, go onto the YouTube and Vimeo channels or Instagram channels or, you know, which, whichever social media channels that you get your information from. Go to AKDN site, go to the music initiative, the historic cities, historic, even I make the mistake of the music initiative go to the akmp to the um, historic cities look up those videos see the transformation for yourself um listen to the interviews with the community members and um i think you'll see the difference it's um it, it doesn't mean that for one single day we can rest on something that is accomplished it's an right. everyday process it has to has to be growing changing adapting every single day because my goodness we do not work in the calmest area uh, of the world, um, as you know very well. There is a set of challenges every single day uh, of the week, but um, having a foundation that is as solid 
as the work of the trust certainly helps. Yeah, and I think His Highness said, right? Our husband mom said that we don't look into years, we think about generations ahead, mm -hmm. how these projects will benefit down the road. So, and I think the park uh, in Cairo Park, it took 20 years or 21 years just to sort of get the green mm -hmm. into that. It took a while, like you said, clean up the dirt. Then there were water tanks that were inserted by the government into the site. They wanted to make use of them, <laughs> those sites. So they, they put three big tanks of water tanks and then the park sort of came on top. And then the wall, of course, it's, it's a project on its mm -hmm. own, a program we can do later on mm -hmm. just on that uh, project. Uh, so I have, I have one question for you, um, and I think this may be our last one. Hopefully um, we'll, we can get to a couple of others, but this past year has uncovered great divisions and disparities across communities. And through this, we're learning about repairing structural inequalities through awareness building, through building stronger relationships with one another. And much of the work of the AKTC is to support that bridge building. Um, can you give us some examples of how arts and culture can bridge connections, mutual understanding, either what we're going through in the United States or around the world? Um, so I don't know, maybe uh, I guess, Khalil, do you want to get us started in the I can, I can try, yeah. I mean, I think the, to for that answer, maybe I'll switch to the Aracan Award for Architecture program. And what that program, which we haven't talked here today, uh, it sort of, you know, identifies projects in different parts of the world, right? Which are buildings that have been nominated and have received the awards. And what that, pro one of the, I think the benefits of that award program has been the concept of diversity and pluralism, right? You get to know what's happening in Burkina Faso, let's say in Africa, or to Tatarstan in Russia, right? Or in India, or in Bangladesh. So I think that program has really opened up the eyes. Oh, there could be a Muslim community in Burkina Faso or, or somewhere, you know, an unknown place, uh, which we haven't heard about. I think Tatarstan, I can confess I had not heard that to the city that had Muslims in that part of Russia before. So, so there are programs of trust which, you know, bring people together, get to know you each other, you know, and sort of, you know, build on tourism and uh, diversity concept. But I'm sure Pharaoh's view was probably you know more. No, I, I, I agree with you completely. Um, we have uh, Raj Isar, our director of education and the audience, he very sweetly wrote to us. So greetings back to you, Raj. But he will tell you that one of his um, uh, assignments when he came on, uh, when he joined the trust as the director of education was trying to crystallize our byproduct of education that we create in, in every single program. And what I think he discovered is that pretty much everything we do can be presented as education from one generation to another, from one community to another. Every single example could be turned into an educational toolkit of some sort. And to me, that's the biggest strength of the, uh, uh, so education in everything that we do. Um, every member of the audience who comes to the Award for Architecture Music Awards, a concert that is staged in a this, in this site that has been restored by the Historic Cities Program and funded through the microfinance program, for example. When all of these very different institutions of the network feed into, in, into one, it, it gives a very tangible example of what can be achieved. And I think um, the communities that we serve are almost always those who are unprivileged and marginalized. We build universities in the middle of the mountains because those are the communities that have no access to good quality education. And so, yes, you're right, uh, the, the person who posed the question. This last year has made those um, uh, differences and inequalities among the communities known to the outside world. But it's the problem that within the AKDN we've been aware of for decades, hence the, insti the, hence the institutional action that so very often was considered um, a pie in the sky by so many. I mean, when the Aga Khan University was created in Karachi, what is it now, almost 40, 30 plus years ago, who believed in nursing as a profession? There was no such thing. There was no such thing as a nurse profession. Now, who can believe in this now? When you look, this, this, is, this is one thing is that 
when you look at the success of these projects, no one wants to remember just how little faith was had um, in empowering marginalized communities. So hopefully um, what has been exposed over the last year will help take those examples that we have helped create and institutionalize them into a developmental action. Okay, I think we have time for one more. And um, this is because I'm a teacher, this is particularly important to me as well. Um, what's your process of making relevant traditions for youth, especially in a globally global pluralistic sonic environment where global commercial popular music is dominant and where Western sonic influences are influ infusing um, the fabric of our societies? Well, the first thing to do is not to listen to skeptics, right? That's the <laughs> that's the first thing to do. I mean, I remember at the beginning of my career, a very powerful minister of culture from the country that will remain unnamed, uh, almost publicly berated me for showing these folksy second rate musicians and not showing the true uh, classical music uh, uh, face of, of, of his country. Well, he has long been fired um, and I'm still here and I get to, I get to do what I love and, and what, what shows the results. So first thing, don't listen to skeptics. Second thing to me, recognize that the world is big enough for all uh, musical and artistic expressions. We don't need to cancel out anybody, right? It's a huge world out there. Everyone has the right to, to express themselves in the way they see fit. Um, what we need to do is to ensure that the kind of music that we believe in can be transmitted from one generation to another. And when the education system for that music is destroyed, the transmission doesn't happen. So as long as we ensure that the education is there, that it's in a relevant form for the new generation of artists and audiences and students, that's it. We've created, there's no such thing as classical music, rap music, folk music, whatever. There's bad music and there's good music. And the good music doesn't happen without good music education. So as long as we build foundation for that, they will find the way uh, uh, in, in, into that world. One of our graduates from the Kabul school recently drummed a tabla live on national TV with a tabla and a computer in the finale of the Afghan Idol. So that's it. That's you know that the, the when when there's a journalist a very long time ago who um, asked me when will you know very pompously when will you know that your job is done and I remember saying that when this music is considered cool again when a 15 year old in Almaty or Kabul or Herat or or uh, an outskirts of London where the um, uh, Rubab music school is when they carry their instrument with just as much pride um, as a guitar in a Western society, that's when we know that our job is done and it's happening, it's happening every single day. We're helping build, create rather, new cultural leaders in the community. Um, and even 15 months of no live music cannot get rid of that. So that I subscribe to. Thank you. Um, Khalil, do you have anything to add? No, I just wanted to add one last comment to Farah's thing. I think uh, to the younger folks, music is not frozen, right? It's mm. evolving daily. It's evolving as we speak now, and it will continue to evolve. So don't just you know think that this may not be good or that. Like Piero said, whatever is good or bad, and I think continue to experiment, evolve, bring in your new talents into it, and feel good about it, and be proud about it. Yeah. So I want to say thank you to you both. Thank you, speakers. Thank you to the audience for joining us today. And hopefully this is just the start of this critical conversation. Today was such a treat for me as I hope it was for all of you watching. And I wanna say thank you again. I have a couple of announcements before we go. Um, so for a recording of this conversation and past conversations, please visit the Facets of Faith page on the, the dot Ismaili USA, um, uh, the Ismaili.USA Facets of Faith. There are some resources that are shared by the panelists, which we're putting in the chat box. So you can go ahead and click on those and save those links. Thank you so much to Khalil and Firos for sharing them. Um, and please look out for more information on the Dot Smiley USA webpage and on social media pages for young adult conversations this week and our next critical conversation. Once again, I would like to thank both our guests for a really enlightening and fun conversation about where we go from here. Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.